Okay. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Evgeny uh, from Fluence. I'm going to quickly talk about Fluence today. I think my talk is the last one before Hackathon officially starts, so I, I, I think I want to be really quick. Um, so, you know, some obvious things in the beginning. Uh, we believe that peer to peer is the future of software in general. Um, so I assume most of people in the audience would agree with me. Um, and basically right now, uh, we are at the stage where crypto uh, very efficiently decentralizing the financial markets. Um, so we are pretty successful in this part. Uh, but um, like we're also trying to decentralize different other and like make a uh, transition from centralized systems to peer to peer systems in other stuff like storage also quite successful identity uh, networking um, but specifically I want to talk about the 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 computing part um, because the the tricky thing about the computing part is that blockchains uh, is also decentralized computing but blockchain is very specific decentralized computing with consensus, uh, usually run by all nodes in the network, some consensus algorithm, proof of work or proof of stake, uh, which basically assumes verification of all the transaction data that um, stores in this replicated database, um, which makes basically um, the uh, constraints, puts constraints on the um, computation and data that you can put there and put constraints on the cost. So like it's basically, and become super expensive. And um, there was another attempt uh, to address the decentralized compute uh, problem um, by other projects who basically created the um, hardware marketplaces. And, uh, but, but they mostly, like some of them still alive, but they, they mostly um, target the high intensive computations like video rendering or like scientific computations, like when you have like a huge task and you want to parallelize it to many, many machines um, to execute it faster and cheaper um, instead of just deploying it to single machine, single cloud or something. Um, but we, what we are trying to solve and what we really lack right now is um, some kind of general purpose um, compute that would not be limited in terms of like permissions, like centralized cloud, uh, would allow to run any code, any task, uh, would allow to basically um, provide APIs, like would allow to use it instead of um, almost any use cases where we use centralized clouds. Like instead of using, putting backends on the cloud, would be nice to be able to just, you know, deploy the computation in the network and get it magically executed or serve like send requests to a network and get response from a network magically as a, like a magical decentralized um, backend for any application. Um, but also um, to have it not limited by devices because like right now um, cloud model dictates the very specific uh, client server model where we have thin client in the browsers, they are limited. Uh, or like on user devices, and then you have the uh, performant computation cloud and development stacks that are very different. So you cannot just, you know, take the piece of code that's being run in the cloud and put it on a user device and run it. It would just not work. So we're looking for something more universal. Um, and like obvious reasons um, why it's important, uh, but just quickly again, um, Centralized infrastructure, basically servers, hardware owned by centralized companies is a risk. Um, but also what is risk is the um, centralized APIs. Like a, if you're using, like if you're building your application using someone else's data and you wanna like enhance your application uh, with someone else's data, like Facebook data or Twitter data or like any other Web2 API, uh, basically these guys, which API you call, they control data and they control the, your access to their data. So um, if you build in your business on top of some other company data, um, you basically dependent on them and they can cut you off and you can lose your business. Uh, and just because of this broken model of centralized silos of data and centralized access um, to this data. Um, but this platform risk also exists now in Web3. Uh, we, um, 
have this success with decentralizing data via blockchain network, which are replicate the state or the network, and you, you can connect to any blockchain node and download any transaction data that you need. Um, or with IPFS, where you can do the same. Um, but uh, a lot of projects building, basically, the indexing um, data stored in decentralized storages, like blockchain or IPFS, and convert it into like different formats, uh, which are better fit different use cases. Like, for example, if you want, basically in blockchain, if you want to um, display the list of NFTs for a particular wallet, uh, you cannot do this with a single request to Ethereum RPC node. You need to, before that, you need to build an index uh, because otherwise you would have to do like a lot of requests from your device, from the user device to the backend uh, Ethereum node. So all these guys are building uh, basically um, indexes, they build APIs, they build their own Web2 HTTP backends, uh, and then um, applications that use them, again, get this problem of uh, being dependent on centralized access um, to these backends. And um, so we, we kind of repeating the, the story of, of the Web2, um, and would be nice to, to solve this um, problem enable real uh, safe composability of applications. Like for example, the, the level of composability that we have inside the blockchains where we have smart contracts that are immutable. And basically if I deployed some smart contract, I, and I put the basically admin, I remove the admin from, from the contract. Uh, it means that it will be there forever. And it's safe to build on top of the smart contract because it cannot be changed. It cannot cut the access off um, from whoever uses them. So would be nice to, to, to have something similar, uh, not on-chain, but also off-chain. Um, and this is the way how we envision um, the peer-to-peer -peer computing. So it basically sits somewhere between on-chain um, and centralized computing. So we don't have middleman, no redundancy. Um, it's the computations optionally verifiable, um, and it's obviously cheaper than, than on-chain. So it's like gives you a lot of flexibility, basically. Um, and use cases are like all kind of blockchain, cross-chain uh, use cases where you need like, a, for example, oracles or transfer asset transfers or dynamic NFTs, things like that. Um, in uh, um, a lot of use cases around um, user control data, data privacy, where you want to uh, compute to bring compute to data and not send data from the device somewhere on the untrusted server. So you should be able to bring compute and compute locally um, and then uh, send the results somewhere in the network or connect users directly and build local first applications. Um, and also um, one of the use cases basically um, we have the decentralized networks um, but they, we still have this um, gap between DAOs that sit on chain and basically govern the new generations of applications, um, and then the execution of these applications. So DAOs are DAOs work for governing on chain applications, but DAOs doesn't work for governing off chain applications. So if we have the DAOs that can really govern the off chain application, then basically we build the, the full stack. We now can have the on chain organization that manages the uh, fund, the processes, decision making, and so on and so forth. And basically, when the decision is made on chain, the off chain um, runtime triggers the update of the application or doing things like that, so like rollouts the new feature or removes the feature, like updates the app and like does anything basically. So you can really uh, link the governance of the app, community governance of the app to community run uh, the, the uh, runtime of the app. Um, yeah, and, and we solve this with Fluence and Fluence is um, three things. Uh, the development stack for the applications, the network that runs this development stack, and the economics uh, around it. So the development stack consists of two biggest important things. Um, first called Marine, which is WebAssembly runtime. Um, it allows to basically run functions um, on any device the same way. Um, and 
brings some you know features of how you build these functions. You can link a few modules together, and you can access file systems. It supports all the WebAssembly standards, so it's pretty cool. Um, and Aqua, which is the control plane for the execution of these functions. So Aqua is a new programming language for peer-to-peer -peer systems where you basically describe the execution, the, the workflow execution of your application in terms of the network and calling different functions on different nodes in the network and including user devices, not only remote, um, remote nodes. Um, so it looks like this. So basically, um, Aqua allows you to, to implement any workflow. And for example, you want to implement some map reduce on the network. So this red squares is nodes. And um, functions inside is the marine functions. So this Aqua code basically says, I want to get some list of nodes that provide get price function, uh, call get price function several of them, and then calculate average uh, on some other node and send it to second user. So it's basically, this is um, application that works without any centralized coordination server, uh, central, without any centralized coordination place. Um, the request being issued by um, first user and then the second user gets the result. But it could be like the first user also get the result. It could be programmed anyway, so it's, it's a workflow. You can program this workflow. Uh, the same way, probably like the, the, the closest analogy would be the um, Amazon step functions. So if you know the Amazon stack, uh, they have lambda functions, which is like a pure functions. Um, and then you have step functions to um, describe the workflow. And uh, their workflow description is basically the um, JSON file. Um, and Aqua is much more flexible. Aqua is a full featured programming language. So you can create any kind of algorithms, basically network algorithms or distributed systems in Aqua. So Aqua um, turns the, this complex cloud services into libraries of the language. And this is pretty cool. So things like load balancing, routing, auto scaling, orchestration, deployment systems, they all basically become the pieces of code in Aqua. Um, so you can build really, really complex uh, distributed systems or peer-to-peer -peer systems uh, just using Aqua. Um, yeah, so again, um, example like a, in, in traditional cloud backend, you have this centralized API uh, gateway usually that talks to services um, on the backend. And with Aqua, it's all sort of uh, being, being uh, served without any, any centralized coordination place. Um, this is how Fluent Spear looks like. Um, so every Fluent node basically runs marine functions, has Aqua VM, which gets requests, um, proxies it them into execution of marine functions, and then send the result whoever um, asked for result. And then it also has scheduled scripts, scheduled Aqua scripts, which basically like a triggering um, marine functions by time. So, um, and um, on, on the other side, basically every Fluence peer can connect to external world, like via HTTP or we are um, uh, linking binaries uh, sitting on the same physical machine. So it could access API, file system, uh, you know, web two networks, web three networks, anything basically. And uh, Fluent Spear by default um, always being shipped with IPFS, so you have you always have IPFS access from any Fluence node. Um, um, but basically, any Fluence node can decide whatever effector services um, it could provide for a network or has access to. Um, and there are also th there are two implementation of Fluent Spear, uh, JavaScript and Rust, and they are a little bit different because JavaScript is uh, designed to work in the browser. Uh, so it has less flexibility in terms of connectivity to network. Uh, and it's always connects to network via relay node. And relay node is like any, any full-featured Fluence node on the network. Um, and Raspberry is kind of like more 
backend sort of uh, node, but they are designed to be as close as possible. So we will try to make them as identical as possible. Um, and if we, if we think of like a Fluent stack, so what we are trying to build is we are trying to reinvent the whole cloud stack from you know, bottom to top. So we have this uh, execution of the functions and then we have the control plate for the functions and then we start building the abstractions on top of it which allow and unlock different features um, like failover, clusters, replication, consensus, load balancing, um, auto scaling and things like that. So it, it, it's going up. Uh, right now this is what exists. Um, so a lot of things needs to be done but applications can already be built um, with the tooling that, that exists now. Um, yeah, so again, uh, basically besides pure marine runtime and pure like a aqua language, right now what you can use when you build on, on, on this stack is you can kind of connect to peers, you can discover peers, you can connect to them, you can discover resources, basically which marine functions are deployed where. Um, you can deploy functions, um, you can call functions, um, and you can schedule the execution of these uh, functions uh, across the network. And then you can uh, basically, uh, there's a thing called trust graph, which is allow you to score and select uh, nodes based on the score. Um, um, I'll talk about it in a minute. Um, and, and also, um, there are plugins basically to external things, to external data layers, uh, like IPFS, Ceramic, and on-chain, and, and blockchains, um, that are also available right now. You can just um, deploy them to, to your nodes. Um, and like all the other cloud features that we expect from the cloud, it's all this magic with scaling and, and fault tolerance is coming and it's gonna be like, we are working on it or we welcome everyone to work on it with us. Um, so it's gonna be a lot of the things. Um, yeah, so, and, and about the um, trust, trustlessness of the computing, um, because like we usually when we use decentralized network, we sort of expect some security model, some verification of computation um, or something like that. So the approach we have uh, to it is that by default, the computation is trusted. So if you're using some remote node and you're deploying your function on it, you trust this node that this function will be executed correctly. Um, so, and like, so what, what it means? It means that you can use with this model, you can use Fluence where you, like in the case when you deploy your own nodes, basically you have your own nodes or you build in peer-to-peer -peer application where basically users, every user is a node in the network. Um, so it's obviously um, no reason not to trust uh, each other in this case. But there's also some flexibility to it. So there's a thing called trust graph. And basically what it means, it works the same way as um, um, SSL certificates work in the browser. Like you have a list of root certificates in your operating system and then you open a website and you see there are certificates and then you verify their certificate against the root certificate that you have in the system. This way you can see that uh, this website has a valid certificate so it was trusted by the um, root authority that you trust, like VeriSign for example. So VeriSign issued them certificate and you trust VeriSign. So similarly, here in the network, uh, nodes can issue trust certificates to each other. So for example, uh, if uh, there's Fluence Labs, our company, uh, if we run some several our nodes, we issue certificates to these nodes. So when your application or users of your application discover these nodes uh, and they wanna execute some functions on these nodes, they would be able to see that these nodes are sort of trusted by us, by Fluence Labs, and if they trust Fluence Labs, they can trust this node. And this chain of trust can be like really, really long, uh, and, but it's subjective. So every user, every application developer can choose whoever authorities uh, they want to trust. So you can build your own, uh, basically, trust graph uh, if you want. Um, 
so it allows you basically to select nodes uh, more tr to, to distinguish more trusted nodes on the network to less on, from tra less trusted nodes. Um, and the second way to get verification is to get a uh, pluggable consensus. So consensus algorithm is the distributed system algorithm. It's also written in Aqua. So it's not yet like we don't have yet um, it on a network, uh, but you can like the simplest algorithm that you can implement is basically when you have our Aqua code that um, calls the same function on several nodes and then collects the results, and basically collects the, um, the results of ex execution with signatures, uh, and then you can specify that like, if I get k out of n uh, signatures, then I think that this result was correct. So I have a consensus on the computation. So you can do um, very simple things. You will be able to do more complex things like BFT or like a raft uh, consensus. Um, but that's the way how you would be able to verify computation um, in real time. Um, but obviously it will be more expensive. You would have you know, more redundancy. So you would be able to tune these parameters like how, how strong consensus you need to have on your, um, on your computation. Um, so basically this development stack runs on the network. And the network is a marketplace of services. So like every node is different. There is no, it's not a blockchain. There is no global consensus on the network. So the network is like IPFS network where like IP, every IPFS network keeps different set of data, but the data is discoverable, right? So here every node is different. Every node decides whatever they want to host, whatever they want to provide to a network among external things uh, or whatever they want to host um, in terms of what was deployed uh, to every node by developers. Um, so that, that means basically this, this network can scale um, almost infinitely. Um, and if you have some consensus there, it's, it's always like a, you know, 10 nodes out of million nodes in the network. So it's not like every node should be involved in this. Um, and basically if we have such a network, which is like a marketplace of the um, hosting providers who host different applications. Now we um, can solve this uh, problem of um, um, API um, access cutting off, like with this, the, 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 the problem of um, non composability of Web2 APIs. So, because now we uh, decoupling the hosting of the applications from the authors of the application. And now we have the, the same model as in the blockchain where blockchain nodes run by, one pe by, by some people and developers of, of the smart contracts are different people. So now if I have the application, for example, um, it's a messenger application. It was deployed to a network and hosted by nodes. Um, and then I release the new version, which I, I introduced some bad feature to it. So, and the nodes may disagree with this bad feature that may decide not to update. Like some nodes may decide not to update, some nodes may decide to update. So now I basically fork the application this way because I'm not fully controlling the runtime. So uh, I cannot say that like this new version of the application will be adopted by, uh, by every node. And because nodes serve users, so now basically we have two versions of the applications uh, and users may choose whichever version they, they want to use. Would they want to switch to a new version where I introduced this bad feature uh, or they want to stay on the previous one? Um, there's kind of a lot of details of how, um, you know, how this all would work, how this all two versions coexist and so on and so forth, but it's all kind of solvable. The, the concept here is that we are decoupling the, the runtime from the, from the author. Um, yeah, so, so basically with this approach, having this network independent of from the uh, application developers, we solve the deplatforming um, problem and basically applications uh, being hosted on demand. So as long as nodes are interested to host, they will host. Um, and um, it's not like if you know, I was a developer and I paid for my Amazon server and then my credit card expired, my application doesn't work anymore. So this model um, works differently. So if, if this application is valuable, probably node's gonna 
uh, be, be um, interested in, in hosting and keeping it alive. Uh, and it it's basically leads us to having these open internet services that always available, rehostable, portable, um, and composable. Uh, so this is this is very cool. Um, so currently we have the Aqua language; it works, uh, and and the network. Um, we constantly improving, fixing bugs, working on stability, and and, and things like that. We are moving into launching the big Fluence DAO uh, and the governance model for the whole network, uh, which should happen this year. And we will transition into um, focusing on the economics of this whole network, like how, like how all the incentives works, how to make sure that, that hosts uh, are online, how to pay for hosting, um, and things like that. Um, and there's a lot of things there uh, to think about. So we basically would be able to enable the new economy of the um, decentralized computation. So um, right now in, um, in Amazon, you have this huge list of uh, details like for what you pay and why you pay and different services have different payment models. So basically we can um, uh, get all of it and more types of the paying for the computation because different nodes would accept different models, different paying models. Some nodes would be uh, fine in be paid, you know, for certain, for hosting certain piece of code for certain time, but within certain limits. Other nodes would want to be paid per request. Third node would be want to do some, you know, uh, short term uh, offerings or like a uh, flexible pricing depending on the day of the time and their load and things like that. So it's all possible um, and um, it's like we're trying not to hard code basically. We're trying to enable the all the spectrum of the um, opportunities of different ways to pay for, for the computation. It's also like a think of DeFi on top of all of this. This is, this is pretty cool. Um, and the last thing here is that, um, so if you have this um, off-chain computation network, like a application platform, uh, we might really start having the DAOs for applications, which you can fund on-chain, and then uh, these DAOs will be tied to the to the application itself. So um, we can solve the problem that, like, if you right now doing the the DAO on-chain which is decoupled from the real product, uh, you basically can run away with money and like the, uh, the product would stop working or uh, there is a lot of things that can happen. So now we can really, really um, make sure that this DAO is related to this particular um, software product, which is run by, by the network. So like it's, uh, um, it's kind of forever. Um, and another thing, another cool thing is open source monetization. Uh, so here, because everything runs on the peer-to-peer uh, -peer network, it's all transparent. And if we have the on-chain economics, uh, we can enable the um, monetization, the reward of people who created the most useful components of the application. Like this is the uh, story from web to world where we have like a huge um, open source databases. Um, that was um, taken by the cloud, and basically because people wanted to have them in the cloud and run them in the cloud, cloud ma making billions of dollars by providing these open source databases as a services, and authors of these databases usually don't get anything back. Usually they have to create their own cloud and compete, so, and, and it's really hard to compete with big clouds like Amazon because Amazon have everything, and, and developers would, wouldn't really want to switch to uh, database developer cloud, which have only the, this database, but doesn't have everything around it. Um, so if we have the services, the, the basically the new peer-to-peer -peer cloud services uh, running on the Fluence network, um, now if I created the database and people reusing it across applications in the network, we can drive a part of revenues of the nodes to the author. So basically author can have some, some kind of royalty from the hosting payments. And this is very cool. This is the, the new way of monetizing um, open source and kind of innovating software that, that we didn't have before. Um, so 
yeah, a couple of links. Um, this is the network dashboard. You can see some services and nodes uh, that that are running right now. Um, and uh, on this hackathon, I'm not sure if I allowed to talk about prizes, but <laughs> uh, we have two prizes basically: just build best application with Fluence and uh, get these uh, great prizes. Uh, and this is the link you can you can. Uh, see a little more details um, about our bounties there. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you so much. Do we have any question? Come on, guys. Don't be shy. Yep. Thanks. Do you have um, any kind of, uh, I don't know, benchmark metrics about the performance of, uh, you know, uh, an application running uh, in uh, on Aqua? Yeah, so I think for Aqua, we don't have any fresh metrics. Uh, we did metrics on Marine, like benchmarks on Marine. Um, you know, we tried to, c to compare it to, to native code running, uh, and it was like a, 30% slower when you use WebAssembly and Marine. Um, but it's sort of not really bad. Like, it doesn't sound bad. Like, the, the, the features, the, the, the advantages it gives you, the benefits it gives you, uh, it's much bigger than this 30% loss. So, um, but on Aqua, I think we, yeah, it would be nice to do uh, some French benchmark, but I, I cannot say for now. Yeah. Well, in general, it, it's designed to be fast. Like, <laughs> it, it's, it, it's, it should not be slower than HTTP. <laughs> okay, guys. Yeah. Um, how do you make sure that the function you execute, you execute in the network is uh, properly executed? And uh, how do you compare the result with other nodes? How, how does it work? Um, so basically, you are if you're writing your code, like your workflow in Aqua, you have full control over it. So if you don't trust particular node, you can do the like in this example. Um, it's it says like a you see there's a loop uh, among peers that sends parallel requests. This par says parallel. So I can specify the list of peers and I can just send the parallel request exe to execute the same um, the same functions. And um, I know it's the same because it's kind of the same um, compiled WASM which is identified by IPFS CID. So I know it's, I, like, I know it's the same, but um, as I said, the, if I don't trust nodes, Theoretically, they can instead of they, they can basically corrupt it or like they can run something else instead of it. So when I do this parallel uh, execution, some of the results, if they corrupt it, will return something different or like they will turn error or something, right? So and that's why if I don't trust, I, I always should have some redundancy. That's um, the the approach here is I have the flexibility on the programming language uh, level, so I can decide myself how do I make sure okay. that this step was executed correctly. What Aqua gives me is the security in terms of uh, from step to step. So it makes sure that whatever results were um, given by this uh, node that executed get price function, this exact result will go to the next step and will be sent to the peer that executes uh, average calculate. So this is Aqua can guarantee. The internals of the function execution, like tricky. So like if you don't trust, use like use consensus, like use basically execute several times and ask for signatures, ask for uh, to get the same result. Hey, thanks for the presentation. I have a question about the code creator economy and how uh, you actually make sure that there's no third party that would, um, 
actually benefit from getting data between the code creators and the network, or how do you make a system that is um, that makes sure that there's no um, value um, taken away from the network? I don't know if it makes sense. Um, so I could give you example like. Um, with this open source monetization concept, for example, if I create a database and then I publish to a network and then people use it, um, and then basically I have this um, in the on the on the payment side of it, I have this um, sort of contract that when developer pays for hosting their application, they also pay for hosting of the database and like a 1% of, of payment to, to of the database hosting should go to the author of database, right? Um, the thing is, if I'm a hosting provider who, um, you know, want to provide the same database but 1% cheaper, I may say, I would, you know, I would provide this database but I would replace the, the author fee, uh, you would not need, like if you, if you consume this database from my node, you would need to pay this author fee. Um, and that's possible, that's, that's basically, but, but, but the thing is, um, this mechanics is the same as forking open source. Like every open source product is open, you can fork it, uh, but how would you drive people to use your fork versus the original product? Because the original product uh, being chosen for particular reasons, it's being maintained by original authors, so it gets updated and updated and updated. So, um, and you would need to maintain your fork as well. So now, um, if you note and you wanna basically fork this, this database, you would need to also maintain your fork um, with every, which, which would every time exclude the, the author fee. So, it cannot guarantee the 100% that 100% developers, uh, authors would receive their fee, but um, there are certain economics incentives that, you know, um, most, of, most of fees would be, there should, like there should be. And uh, it only makes sense to switch to node who forked only if their product is better, if they made the product better. But this basically means that they, they did a different product and now they receive a fee. So that's, that's the logic here. Thank you so much. Uh, are we good? No more question? So thank you so much. Thank you, guys. And, th and a special thanks to Friance because Friance is a partner of the festival and it's helped us a lot and it's helped to to have the festival free. So thank you so much, Florence.